Georgia. I didn't know Georgia was in D.C. till I saw her this morning. I saw in the email that Georgia was here, and she's interning for Claire Ruth Luce, so I'm so excited about that. <coughs> I want to thank you all for having me this morning. I know it's early on a Saturday, but it's kind of nice because there's, like, no one here on Capitol Hill, and there's, like, parking and <laughs> all those fun things. Um, I have a lot of fond memories of working uh, just right next door over at the RNC, being the lowly assistant and planning all the events here at the Capitol Hill Club, so I'm really excited to be here. I want to talk a little bit about my personal life um, and some thoughts I have about <clears throat> abortion, hormonal birth control, feminism, the future of feminism. I think some of the statements, well, I know, most of the statements that I say, uh, like this on college campuses, are often very controversial. They may not be so controversial here in this room today, um, but they might. Um, so we will do a Q&A after I finish speaking, um, and you know, make sure to jot down your questions. Hopefully, um, some of the things that we talk about today will be helpful for you in your discussions when you go back to campuses in August and in September. I grew up in a pretty small town in West Virginia uh, with my parents and my younger sister. Uh, my dad was raised by a mostly single mother, um, lived in poverty his whole life, uh, was the first person in his family to graduate high school. Uh, after high school, he got a good um, blue collar uh, paying job that he actually just retired from uh, excitedly uh, this February. He met my mother in high school and they've been married uh, for decades now. Uh, my mom went to college after high school when they were married and became a teacher. So I lived like this pretty like normal blue collar upbringing in West Virginia. There's no one in my family was ever like a political activist. Uh, we never really talked about politics still to this day. I don't think half of my family understands what I do for a living, uh, nor do some of them want to. Um, but it's always when I like look back on my life and why I am the way I am, <clears throat> why I've taken the actions I've taken, I always think about those occasions that I had uh, you know, that one-on-one -on -one time with my dad, uh, really always being that motivator for me, that driver in my life, to do my best, to be the best, to be the best in my graduating class, to make straight A's and uh, get that college scholarship. Um, a good way to describe my upbringing with my dad uh, would be, you know, in first grade, one of my earliest memories of school was in first grade, and I got a B on like this math quiz or whatever, um, and he made me go in the next day early and ask the teacher for extra credit to make up that B. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, and you can feel sorry for my employees later. Um, my, but for my dad, uh, me going to college, me getting a full ride scholarship to college, and me having a career wasn't like a, a dream he had, uh, it was like a requirement of me. Um, that I would be able to have choices in my life, and this is how he usually explained it to me in those like trips back and forth from volleyball and basketball games, it was to have choices in my life. So that I could go to college and I could choose the career I wanted to have, that I could choose the job I would want to have, that I wouldn't be stuck in a job that I hated for 40 plus years. But I also knew that getting married and having children was something I wanted to do too. I always saw my mom hustling. She was like the first person, so she's a morning person, it's easier for her than me, but she was like the first person up every day, getting everyone's lunches made, putting dinner, whatever dinner she was concocting in the crock pot, making sure everyone's you know after school uniforms were washed, getting us to school, coming home from her job, making sure we had dinner, usually taking us to some church function we had, getting us back to the house, making sure homework was done, washing all the dishes, getting all the clothes, you know, washed, the house reset, back for the chaos in the, in the coming morning. I wanted that too, to have that career, but also uh, to be that mother. Now, I think if I had known how difficult it is to be that first person up and the last person to sleep, I would have maybe thought about it harder a little bit. Um, but I knew I wanted that. And if you asked me in high school, and if you have asked me even in college, if I considered myself a feminist, I would have said, hell yeah. I knew I was pro-life, but I also knew that I was better than most people, you know, all the boys in my class. Like, there wasn't like a debate. Like, I was valedictorian of my high school. I was 
Um, I had the highest GPA in my graduating class of college. I graduated a year early from high school. I graduated a year early from college, and I still beat the boys. Um, so I never thought that because of my gender or my genitalia, I was less than the men in my class. Like, I knew I was better than them. <laughs> um, but today, at 32, and I get asked this question a lot, especially since, you know, the election of President Trump, especially in light of that, I get asked a lot in interviews, you know, do you consider yourself a feminist? Are you a pro-life feminist? And while I would use to call myself that, and I think my life is a testimony to what those first wave feminists, and even those second wave feminists envisioned for women, well, that women could go to college and choose the career of their choice. You know, I, I'm the primary breadwinner for our family. Our, our, my husband now doesn't work. He's a stay-at-home dad and homeschools our children. I run an organization of 40 plus people. I think my life is sort of, you know, the embodiment of what a lot of those first wave and second wave feminists envisioned for women in America. But I, but now, I don't really call myself a feminist, nor do I really care to be called a feminist. You see, while the overwhelming majority of Americans and overwhelming majority of women, obviously, believe in the goals of our feminist foremothers, that, you know, equality for human beings, that I'm pretty sure, and well, I know, that today's mainstream feminist movement and those lingering uh, leaders of the second wave feminism of the 1960s and early 70s, they would tell you that I don't belong in the feminist movement, nor do they want me in the feminist movement. The women that we serve as students for life, that we train and we build up, aren't wanted in the today's mainstream feminist movement. I believe that the original egalitarian and maternal feminists, those first wave feminists, they wouldn't be accepted or wanted in today's mainstream feminist movement either. Women like Mary Wollstonecraft, Frances Willard, Susan B. Anthony, uh, Elizabeth Kennedy Stanton, even Alice Paul. And it's all over one issue. That's the violence of abortion. This was demonstrated perfectly the January after President Trump was elected. The Women's March was called together right after Trump's election. We all thought Hillary was going to win. The glass ceiling hadn't been shattered. People were crying. CNN keep, kept replaying that uh, video montage of the women crying at the Hillary, um, the victory celebration that never was. Uh, so we had this Women's March, and the organizers of the Women's March put it out, out on Facebook. It was for all women. Women to unite across America to stand up against violence, against violent rhetoric. I actually contacted the Women's March uh, co-founder, Bob Land. Um, she's a woman, but her name's Bob, so I'm not, I'm a little, I don't know if she's transgender or, or non-transgender, I don't know. But I contacted her and I, I said, you know, we would love to co-sponsor. We're an organization of mostly all women. We serve mostly all women. Uh, and we are obviously against any violence. Uh, we'd love to co-sponsor. I knew what the answer was going to be, just, just FYI. Because <laughs> um, some people are like, really, would you con I'm like, well, that would have been a different problem we'd have to figure out. But we never heard a response. Two weeks later, Planned Parenthood was announced as the platinum sponsor of the Women's March. Some of my um, um, companions in the pro-life movement who have pro-life feminist groups had s snuck in there online and they like accepted them as sponsors because their organization didn't name didn't say for life in it. When an Atlantic article came out a couple weeks before the Women's March that featured me and a couple other women who are pro-life were like, yeah, we're going to the Women's March. I wasn't accepted. They might have been. All those pro-life feminist groups were then suddenly denied. The Women's March came out with this long statement of beliefs. Now, suddenly it wasn't for all women. It was only for certain women. And one of the statements of beliefs were, in, you know, that abortion should be legal in all nine months for any reason, in line with the Democratic National Committee. Something that the good news is only 13% of American women actually agree with. Only 17% of millennials actually agree with their, their statement on abortion. But we were there anyway. We decided to go. Uh, we had these 20-foot banners, abortion betrays women, we don't need Planned Parenthood. And we got into the crowd, and the crowd was so large, and 
It was a mess on Capitol Hill because the inauguration just had happened, so there were barricades everywhere. So we finally got to Constitution Avenue, and the thought was we were just going to sign wave as people walked by. As the march walked by us, they would, everyone would see us there. And we were sitting down with all of our student volunteers, who mostly were young women in high school. Um, somehow the college girls were too afraid to come out. It was, we got high schoolers to come out. Um, and we just had this idea. We saw this march starting, and it was, it was all disoriented. The, the organizers of the march were at the end of the march, and so the march just started happening without them. And no one was leading the march. There wasn't a banner. So we just dropped our pizzas and our wagons, which later on were stolen when we went back. And we just got in front of the march. And we led the women's march and well on past to the White House until they figured out, the 50 and 60 year old women in a nice fur coat figured out we weren't with them and started hitting our students and spitting us and putting their butts in front of our signs so we couldn't move. Somebody had their baby, there was two women with babies and their baby strollers using their babies to block our signs, you know, put the baby's life in danger over a sign. It's feminism. <laughs> um, but we were there. We wanted to be there because we wanted to be there for the women who were hurting, for the women who've been duped into believing the lies of the mainstream feminist movement, believing that abortion is this option of freedom and choice, of real choice. We were there for the women who've been murdered, who've been killed by legal abortions in our country. Katamaya Maranguru, who was killed by Kermit Gosnell just a few years ago in Philadelphia, when no of the, none of the mainstream press even bothered to pick it up. Tanya Reeves, who was killed by Planned Parenthood not too long ago, but no one ever dares to talk about that. We were there for the women who saw our signs and their friend was going, fuck you, and yelling at us, and all this stuff. They were holding an F Trump sign, and the woman would look look at our sign, abortion betrays women, nod her head, put her head down, keep walking. We were there for those post-abortive women. We were there for our generation. This generation of women who's been misogynistically told since the 94 Casey v. Planned Parenthood uh, decision that women need abortion, it's critical for us to succeed in a male-dominated workplace, that we have to have abortion. Ladies, I reject the lies of mainstream feminism, that abortion sets women free, that abortion is needed to ensure my freedom, that I must pay somebody to commit a violent act against another human being in order that I can have freedom, in order for me to have control of my life. I believe abortion is and always will be that opposite of empowerment for women. It's not empowerment. The question that I often have and often I raise to reporters is what happened to feminism in America? When did the fight for equality become this extremist agenda that advocates for violence for those weaker than ourselves? Throughout the years and the different waves of feminism, there have always been you know, core principles that remain constant. The discipline of nonviolence, the demand for equality, the understanding that one human being should never be able to oppress another human being or treat another human being like property. These principles have remained constant in the different waves of feminism, yet they define the act of abortion. It is violence. It's not equality. And it treats another human person like property that can be disposed of. And I think, well, some abortion advocates uh, will try to muddy the conversation about abortion and say, well, we don't know when life begins. It's unclear. The profound reality and the profound reality that science shows us is that life in the womb is life, that the child is a unique, whole, living human being that's never existed before and will never exist again. This child is growing, it's alive, it's a human being, it's a human person. This child is growing, it's responding to stimuli, it has the ability to reproduce. That's the, that's the characteristics of living organisms. It's alive, it's a human person. 
I don't know if you all saw, there was a Canadian group. I was really proud of the Canadians because usually they're not this bold. But they put out this Facebook post uh, a couple weeks ago. It was like this video of like the magical birth canal. Have any of you seen it? It was so funny because I was like, I can't believe Canadians actually did it. But it's so true, right? You're a baby, you're not. You're a human, you're not. And it's literally like six inches of the vaginal canal that determines the difference. That's crazy and that doesn't make sense. Right? But often when I tell people, like, look, regardless of whether or not you want to believe in science, you have to admit it's violence. Abortion is violence because it destroys something. It ends the life of something. And you have to admit it's about one person choosing the life of, of the outcome of another person. It's oppressing, one person oppressing another person. So. At its core, abortion is anti-feminist. And the feminist foremothers and the suffragists, those first wave feminists, they knew this. Mary Wollstonecraft, she kind of kicked off you know, feminist thought, 1792, her vindication of rights of women. She spoke openly against abortion. She said, women becoming consequently weaker in mind and body than they ought to be were one of the grand ends that are being taken into account, that bearing and nursing children have not sufficient strength to discharge the first duty of a mother and sacrificing to lavishness the parental affection that nobles instinct, either destroy the embryo in the womb or cast it off with, when born. Nature and everything demands respect, and those who violate her laws seldom do so without impunity. And Mary Wilson Craft was not like a conservative lady, like Wikipedia, her personal life. She was a very progressive thinker. She lived very progressively for 1790s, but she knew. Elizabeth Candy Stanton, she was partners with Susan B. Anthony. Elizabeth Candy Stanton had actually served in the slavery abolitionist movement for a number of years alongside her husband. Actually got dissuaded with the abolitionist movement because they weren't accepting a female leadership. Elizabeth Candy Stanton wrote openly against abortion. Sarah Norton, she's um, best known, I think, for win winning, uh, being the first woman to win acceptance into Cornell University and Ivy League wrote openly against abortion. Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president, her and her sisters in their own magazine, apart from you know Susan B's Revolution magazine, Victoria wrote openly against abortion. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first woman in America to earn a medical degree, wrote openly against the notorious uh, Madame Restell, the illegal uh, abortionist that was living in New York City at the times. Dr. Charlotte Lowyer, once again, one of the first women doctors in America. Susan B. Anthony. I don't know if, did any of you all see the SNL skit with Susan B. Anthony not too long ago? I love that skit. Oh, I never am like up that late on a Saturday night. Um, but I watched it on Hulu later. But it was great. Like, I, you know, they're making fun of her for having antiquated views. But it, the premise is these young girls are going to see Susan B.'s house. And I've been to the birthplace, by the way. And they're always looking for interns at the Susan B. Anthony birthplace. Just a little plug. It's in Adams, Massachusetts. It's in the Berkshires. You have to like nature and hiking and stuff like that. But it's like awesome because it's where she was born. They have all of the uh, Revolution magazine articles archived. And they do all kinds of research. So if you're into that, see me later. Um, but Susan B. actually moved to Rochester, New York, and lived there. And so these women, SNL women, were at the Rochester house, and they were touring the house, and the ghost of Susan B. appears. And at first, they think it's really cool. They whip out their phones and take, like, a selfie with Susan B. And then she starts saying these things that she believed. And then the girls, you can tell, they're millennials, so they get distracted. The cell phone's done, and then they're trying to find their Uber and trying to figure out how to get to the train station. And Susan B. is just kind of, like, still there, and they're just, like, not paying attention to her anymore. And as she as they go to leave, she goes, abortion is murder. I'm like, damn it, finally, they're recognizing it. How long has it been? When the Susan B. Anthony Birthplace Museum was actually opened up, it was a big controversy because on their wall, they have different uh, you know, subject areas that the Revolution Magazine talked about and openly explored. And they have a whole wall dedicated to abortion. And the feminist historians across the country were so upset. How dare you talk about this subject? She wasn't pro-life. It's just because of the time that she was living in. If she was living in today's world, she'd be, you know, with us on women's equality and women's rights. And even SNL finally got it. It was great. It was great. No one else watched it but the pro-life movement. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> it was Alice Paul. 
the original author of the ERA, which by the way, have you all seen that the ERA was just passed in Illinois? Their objective is to pass the ERA in one more state, and then it's going to be a court battle, and they're going to try to go through the courts to ratify the ERA into the Constitution. By the way, that's a really bad idea because the legal understanding is it will cement into law, into the Constitution, a right to abortion and taxpayer-funded abortion. So please don't be fooled by the words ERA. I'll be doing more on that lately uh, in the next couple of months, I guess. Um, Alice Paul, though, the original author of the ERA, was actually pro-life. She wrote openly, abortion is the ultimate exploitation of women. I actually think she aptly predicted what was going to happen in the 60s and 70s. You know, 40 years after the 19th Amendment, 40 years after we won our right to vote, that second wave of feminism was kicked off with the Equal Pay Act of 1963, which made it illegal to pay men and women, you know, um, different wages for the same work. Then the Civil Rights Act of 64 included provisions that prevented um, hiring and promotion discrimination based on sex. Contrary to popular belief, Betty Friedan's first edition of Feminist Mystique did not you know, talk about this right to abortion and contraception. The book, you know, which is largely held to be responsible for the launch of second wave feminism, was, was a book against you know, that restlessness, that desire that women felt that they weren't being fulfilled in their lives just as mothers, as, as homemakers. It wasn't this rallying cry for abortion. It was two men, actually, Larry Ladder and Bernard Nathanson. Uh, Larry Ladder was uh, the former executive director of the Hume War Fund, which is a population um, eugenicist group where they believed that there was an impending population bomb in the 1970s coming. Uh, Larry Ladder actually was a biographer of Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Uh, Mark Sanger was a known eugenicist. Uh, it was Larry Ladder and Bernard Nathanson. Bernard Nathanson was a, an abortionist there in New York State. They actually formed NARAL, the National Association of the Appeal Abortion Laws. Today it's called NARAL Pro-Choice America. These two men, Larry had known Betty Friedan from some Marxist circles in New York City. They went and met with Betty and convinced her to include abortion in the second edition of Feminist Mystique. Uh, Ladder, um, Ladder continued to be pro-abortion throughout his life. Bernard Nathanson actually, later in the 80s, converted to Christianity, uh, became pro-life, actually filmed one of, at the time, uh, the most shocking video there ever was against abortion. It was an ultrasound of a live abortion taking place. And you can see the baby squirming and moving away uh, from the suction device. Uh, Nathanson wrote openly about these conversations with Ladder and their decision, because the decision came down of how abortion had to be moved from this white, upper-class, male eugenics world uh, to this new up-and-coming women's movement. And how it was this strategy of we have to have these women advocating for abortion. It's not working just with us men doing it. The population control people weren't making that uh, shocking link, that convincing of an argument for why you should destroy human beings. It was two men who hijacked uh, that second, that, uh, the up and coming second wave of feminism for their own gain. And there's actually a great book out there. Um, Sue Ellen Browder wrote it. It's called Subverted. You can find it on Amazon. Sue Ellen uh, was a writer, cosmopolitan in the late 60s. She's had an abortion. She later, um, in later life, has converted to Catholicism. Uh, but Sue Ellen actually has a really great um, chapter in the book about the 1968 Now Convention and how abortion suddenly became, you know, at the end of the night when no one was in the room, abortion was inserted into this platform. And I thought that was, it's a, it's a really interesting art, um, chapter of the book. If you read nothing else, and I know I have a hard time like sitting down and reading whole books, read the chapter about the Chinese, the room with the Chinese walls. Uh, she talks all about this 1968 Now Convention. And that is when that, that's that definitive moment when abortion was made, this requirement to be in part of the feminist movement. Now, I'm not arguing that, you know, women go back to the 1950s barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, although I love doing both. And on some <laughs> college campuses, I whip out my apron just to make people get the visual of what I like to do in my spare time. Um, but I don't see 
I don't see a, a, a solid way forward for today's mainstream feminist movement either. Because today's leaders demonize all choices except abortion. Today in America, we, as women, have full equality under the law. Now, there's things that we have to work on, and there's obvious prosecutions and defense of those equality, their equality that have to take place. But we have full equality under the law. We have incredible freedoms in the U.S., freedoms that our sisters and other nations can even hope to obtain in their lifetime. I can drive a car. If I'm pissed off with my husband, I can walk in front of him on the street. I can vote. I can own property. I can inherit wealth. I can speak my mind, even if it's unpopular opinion. I don't live in fear that my daughter's genitals will be mutilated because she's a woman. I don't live in fear that she'll be sold off to a child abuser at age 12 as a bride. We have incredible freedoms. But yet, if you listen to the abortion industry, if you listen to Planned Parenthood, if you listen to NOW, if you listen to NARAL, those women who lead today's mainstream feminist organizations, they will claim that what we have is not enough. They'll say, stand up, fight back, women's rights are under attack. Right? That's the motto that's been screamed at me for hours on the end in front of the Supreme Court. That our interests in an integrated and a successful and a happy, fulfilled life, they've been reduced to abortion and hormonal contraception. That's all we want. That's all we need. That's their agenda to fully empower women. And they've institutionalized this radical belief everywhere. It's in the words of the abortion worker who told one of our team members, Allie, you know, it'll be over. It's a quick, easy procedure. Ten minutes, you'll be back to school like nothing ever happened. It was a lie. Something that Allie still regrets and still deals with. It's in the words of the um, counselor at Fordham University that told one of our students, Eleanor, well, you can have the abortion or you, you can remain pregnant, but if you remain pregnant, you can't live on campus anymore as a pregnant student. And if you move off campus, you're gonna lose your $10,000 a year housing scholarship. That's at a Catholic college, I mean, it's Jesuit, but it's a Catholic college. <laughs> but that's what we hear. This is an institutionalized belief that you have to choose. You have to choose between your life and the life of your child, and there's no other option. There's nothing else out there for you. We've been sold a bag of lies from mainstream feminism. I think the first lie that we've been sold, a very obvious one that no one really ever likes to talk about, is a myth that sex is without consequence. Guess what? Like, sex has consequences. Right now, in 2018, we live in midst of what the CDC proclaims an STD epidemic. Despite condoms being everywhere, STDs are growing, and now there's these, I was reading about this new gonorrhea, you know, strain that they're not even, they don't even know how they're going to treat it because now these STDs are becoming antibiotic resistant. That's like the next super bug, by the way. It's going to be something that's antibiotic resistant, and we're all screwed, so just FYI. <laughs> not saying, it's not going to be an STD, but. They've institutionalized this belief. And you can't talk about it to the contrary. Our Students for Life group at Baldwin Wallace University this fall they were denied they wanted to have a table at their LGBTQ plus IA sex fair. And it was going to be about abortion, hormonal contraception. There were going to be information about the local pregnancy center. And they were literally told in writing that they couldn't have a table at the sex fair because their message wasn't sex positive. Okay. Our culture has made sex into something that's casual. It's nothing means nothing. So of course, you know, hormonal birth control and abortion had to follow because sex was for fun. You weren't, you weren't committing to spend your life with somebody. You weren't in a committed relationship when you were engaging in that sex. You just were there to have fun. You were just there for the momentary pleasure, the momentary, you know, reprieve from the loneliness that you feel. So of course, hormonal birth control and abortion had to come because you have to stop a very natural consequence of what happens and heterosexual sex, by the way, I have to clarify on college campus. Very natural consequence of heterosexual sex is the creation of a new human being. Like that's one of the main purposes of sex, is reproduction. 
by the way, this is very shocking to people on college campuses these days. Like, it's kind of crazy. I mean, some, you know, consequences of sex are like, man, that was a really bad experience. You know, inconvenience or, you know, a little embarrassing of like a rash. Some are deadly, like HPV or HIV. And others come with 18-year-long financial and emotional commitments to raise another human being in this world. Every decision that you make is going to have a consequence to it, and sex has that interesting one. I think once, um, and this is really fun to talk about this at conservative groups, too, because a lot of conservatives, we don't talk about sex, too. They're like, oh, that's the pro-lifers. They just talk about abortion. But when you talk about sex, everyone gets really uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I also love, like, in the Q&As, or like when they do on the Facebook or Twitter feed after I speak of like, well, of course she's, you know, spouting her abstinence of you because no one would have sex with her. She's fat and ugly or whatever. I'm like, I have four kids. I have <laughs> lots and lots of, and in case you have hung out with pro-lifers, we tend to have, I mean, look at Rachel Campos Duffy. <laughs> and look at her husband. They have lots of sex. Okay? Um, it's not that we don't have sex or we don't enjoy sex. Obviously we do. But I think... That was this huge lie of saying sex doesn't have to have consequences. Once that first lie, that first myth of feminism was propagated in our society, then you had this very natural, you know, well, not natural, very logical consequence of, well, now you need hormonal birth control. I'm not talking about barrier method birth control. In the pro-life movement, we have you know, different, I know, vernacular. Barrier method birth control would be condoms, female condoms, all kinds of stuff to stop sperm from hitting egg, okay? <laughs> I'm talking about hormonal birth control. And this is something we don't talk about, especially in the conservative movement, because there's a lot of varying opinions about this. And I don't make an argument you know, that, I'm not making a religious argument, but this is what the feminist movement has said, is contraception is necessary for us to have the lives we want, right? We can't have sex and have careers and have like, these babies and getting in the way, so we have to have hormonal contraception, which stops us from getting pregnant. One thing I would always try to remind people when you talk about hormonal contraception, you talk about you know, stopping women's bodies from doing something that's very natural and should happen, is that yes, when men and women are different. Social science and biology overwhelmingly prove this. You don't have to look much further than our brains. We are the superior sex, by the way. <laughs> like, our brains, neurologists have confirmed, social scientists have confirmed that our brains, we have more neurons connecting the left and right hemisphere. We can multitask. It's why when I'm gone, I have to grill the hamburgers, make all the dinner meals for my husband, so all he has to do is go to the microwave and press 30 seconds, and it's done. And I call, and if I don't do that, like if I don't like grill the hamburgers, I just leave the hamburgers in the refrigerator, and all he has to do is grill them. And I'll say, what did you eat today? And he was like, I'm starving. I'm like, you had hamburgers in the refrigerator. And he'll say, I never had time. There wasn't time. Because he can't multitask. I love him, but he can't multitask. We're different. We're wired differently. Guess what? I can grill hamburgers. I can be on the phone. I can be making sure a child isn't choking to death. I can do all that at the same time. Now there's reasons, you know, men tend to like focus and do really good at like focusing on one thing and doing it perfectly sometimes if they want to do it. <laughs> but we're different and that's okay. Our bodies were made differently and that's okay. Surprisingly, this was my most controversial line in my entire speech this spring because I say that men and women are different. But surprisingly, this is the most controversial. I thought it was like the least. We're, we're different, but that's okay. That doesn't mean we're not equal, right? Our bodies are different. We've been designed differently. Like I said, we are superior. Not only can we multitask, we can literally grow another human being inside of us. Men can't do that. I think if you look at the first wave feminist writings about contraception, the rudimentary contraception they had uh, in the you know, late 1800s, they actually spoke openly against it. And the reason they spoke out against contraceptive use wasn't religion. Uh, it was about the promiscuity of men. They believed that telling a woman, here, do this, do this, allowed men to cheat on their spouses, to have mistresses. I think they were right. Look what we have today. We have this hookup culture. We have men and now even women addicted to pornography. The, the people don't even want to have sexual relations with, with another human being because they'd rather just watch it on 
their computer screen or their phone. Not only that, that we know that, you know, we do know that hormonal birth control can be abortifacient. We don't know the likelihood, but we know it can because we know breakthrough ovulation occurs, that women who are on the pill or the patch do get pregnant, which means eggs are being released from ovaries. So at some point, there's probably early abortions happening. And it says right there on the back of Plan B, the third way the Plan B works is that if a fertilized egg, a fertilized egg cannot implant into the uterine lining. In the late 60s, ACOG, the American Association of OBGYNs, actually changed the definition of pregnancy from, in, from conception, meaning egg and sperm unite, forming a unique whole living human being. That was once the definition of pregnancy. They changed the definition of pregnancy to implantation. So now it's no longer pregnancy, it's no longer a life, unless that human being implants into the uterine wall. So your location actually changes whether or not you're a human being now. And on the back, of the Plan B box, it literally says this, that it will prevent a fertilized egg. If you Google fertilized egg, it comes up zygote. You were once a zygote. You were once an embryo. You were once a fetus. You didn't come from one. You once were one. The zygote is a stage in human's life. It will prevent the fertilized egg from implanting. And we use the word fertilized egg because that's semantics, right? Because fertilized egg doesn't sound like human being. Embryo sounds a lot worse. Does that make sense to everyone? So we know it can be a abortifacient, but we also know it, it doesn't prevent all the unplanned pregnancies either. In a recent study from BPAS last summer, so BPAS is a British Pregnancy Advisory Service. They are the Planned Parenthood of the UK. They're the largest abortion event in the UK. In the Huffington Post, they wrote, it turns out over half of women who procure abortions do so because of their failure of their contraceptive method. In fact, the study of 60,000 women found that contraceptive use contributes to a greater likelihood that women will actually have later term abortions because they assume they can't get pregnant using contraception and they miss early pregnancy signs as a result. In response to this study, Ann Ferretti, the BPAS chief executive officer, said, quote, our data shows women cannot control their fertility through contraception alone, even when they're using some of the most effective methods. Family planning is contraception and abortion. Abortion is birth control that women need when their regular method lets them down. And we've seen the scientific articles about hormonal contraception being bad for our bodies. Do you, any of you remember L Ricky Lake from the 1990s? She's like a talk show. Oh gosh, I'm old. Okay, so Ricky Lake, she had like this talk show and it was like really popular. She's actually producing a documentary right now called Sweetening the Pill. These are not pro-life ladies. They're pro-abortion. They vote for pro-abortion candidates, but you can actually follow them on Facebook and they have a, it's a great Facebook page and they have all these podcasts. Um, and it's all about this whole documentary they're producing is how women are being lied to that we can't even have an honest conversation in our country about what hormonal contraception does to our bodies. And this is not a pro-life argument at all. This is a, I was really messed up when I was on the birth control pill. I was depressed. I never felt right. Why was I making these decisions? Uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center study found that women who use birth controls, uh, birth control pills could face a minimum of 50% increased risk in developing breast cancer. I mean, this is coming out of the UK. And then they actually went on in the study and they listed every single type of birth control pill, like the five most popular, and then they, they went through and listed every single risk uh, based on the hormonal estrogen doses they were giving. This November in the Sacramento Bee, I was reading an article. It was a Danish study that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. So like not a pro-life source, not a kooky pro-life source. They tracked, this Danish study tracked 500,000 women for eight years, eight years, and found the risk of attempting suicide was nearly twice as high for women who were using hormonal birth control. The depression rates were off the chart. And don't forget that the World Health Organization has labeled hormonal birth control as a group one carcinogen, the same as asbestos and cigarettes. Despite all this stuff, how many women even know this? How many times does this even come up when women are going to their OBGYN, when they're having a discussion with their doctor? Just bringing up these facts makes people really angry with me. People get very upset because this is a personal issue. Many of us were put on birth control to regulate, you know, painful periods or ovarian cysts and told, oh, it's fine, you'll be okay. But no one ever talks about this. But it's the lie of feminism that you can't even talk about this because if you speak about this, you're speaking out against women. 
And you're speaking out against women's bodies and women's freedom. How dare you? So once we had sex without consequence, once we had hormonal birth control, then we had to have abortion because guess what? Birth control isn't that effective sometimes. As condoms have an 18% failure rate, the birth control pill has a 9% failure rate. I'll tell you what, if the plane I was getting on tomorrow had a 9% failure rate or an 18% failure rate, I would not step on the damn plane because <laughs> I want to get home. Now, you can argue my driving might you know, have worse failure rate. I don't know. I've never studied that. So once you had those things, you had to have abortion because you're having sex, you're in a relationship, or maybe you're not in a relationship, you get pregnant, you never were intending to have this child. And then those next lies come. That abortion is needed for women to be free and achieve our goals, and that abortion is harmless and that's safe. And we can start with the fact that today the abortion argument is not about whether or not abortion kills. 1995 third wave feminist, radical third wave feminist Naomi Wolf wrote in the New Republic, the statement, abortion stops being heart, is inconvertibly true. Pro-abortion feminist Camille Paglia wrote in Salon, I've always frankly admitted that abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful. In Conscience, a Catholic magazine, former Catholics for Choice President Francis Kiesling declared the fetus has value. We're not arguing about abortion kills. I mean, like, if, you, if you're arguing with somebody on campus and I'm telling you abortion doesn't kill, like, I just say, can, you, can we stop and Google it first? Can you look at this ultrasound image? Like, it kills something. Duh. I mean, it's, like, not hard. I'm not, like, the best apologist, by the way, because I don't have time for stupid people. I, well, our team's really good at that. I'm not, I'm not the best person. Because you can tell, like, even if I fake it, like, and I'm trying to listen to your stupid arguments, it can still kind of tell me that I really don't care. Um, so the argument today isn't, you know, isn't about you know, what it kills, it's, it's that it has to be killed in order for someone to be free. That's what I think is so sad is when you see when pr students for life groups or if I'm out from an abortion facility and you're praying and you're trying to counsel women going into the center and women will tell you, I just can't have this baby right now. It's either me or it. She's not saying, I can't have this, this fetus, this fertilized egg, like I gotta get this thing out of me. She recognizes it, and mo mostly she's already Googled it. She knows what abortion is. She's still choosing her life over someone else's life. She feels like she has to choose. And rather seeking to truly serve pregnant women, women in crisis, that moment of confusion, most of us in our country, we just tell her to Google it, to get it taken care of, to go to the Planned Parenthood that will be conveniently located right down the street from our college campus. 79% of Planned Parenthoods are five miles from our college campus. As she seeks advice from her boyfriend, her partner, her friends, her family, even church members, she'll hear that feminist lie, that mantra repeated over and over again, your body, your choice, your body, your choice. The context of what she hears when someone says that to her is just have the abortion. I think you should have the abortion. Instead of offering reassurance and encouragement to her, saying you can do this. It's going to be hard, but I'll be with you. You're strong enough to do this. You can be a mother and be a student. You can be a mother and have your career. We say, no, you can't. Planned Parenthood doesn't empower women. They tell them that they can't, that they're not strong enough. Because of the legalization of abortion, and yes, all nine months of pregnancy, abortion is legal in all nine months. Our nation hasn't had to have enough of these conversations about these difficult conversations about what more can we do? What do we lack in our society? How can we help her? How can we provide the support and the resources that she needs? Because we know no woman feels enthusiasm for abortion. No one's going in front of the abortion facility saying, I'm going to exercise my right to choose today. I'm so excited. No one's like, no woman's like excitedly talking on her phone about, yeah, I'll be right there later. I just gotta stop in for a quickie. No one does that. She's often looking down. She's often crying. 
Sometimes her partner, a lot, oftentimes her partner's there and doesn't want her to have the abortion, but he feels like he can't say anything because he's been emasculated to say, your body, your choice, my mom said never to say anything. So he silently is begging her not to do it, but he won't say it to her, he won't tell her. She's hoping he'll say, hey, don't do this. You wouldn't believe how many people, how many men call our office. Like, what do I do? My girlfriend's having an abortion. How do I stop it? Tell her. Tell her. No one is excited when they go in and have the abortion. It's a sad, it's a solemn event. That's why they're trying to change it. That's why you saw, starting in 2016, this effort to destigmatize abortion. One in three, which it actually is a lie. That's not a correct statistic. One in three of abortion. I'm one in three. They've moved away from safe, legal, and rare because they realize that's stupid. They should have never adopted that monster. It helped Bill Clinton win because he got all these pro-life, blue-collar people to vote for him and didn't like abortion. But it was really a bad move on their part, strategically a bad move. Because if nothing's wrong with abortion, if abortion is this ultimate societal good, then why the hell should it be rare? Right? Why should it be rare? So they've changed it. They don't ever use that mantra ever again. They know they can't. They've got to go hard left. Abortion is a good option. Abortion is a societal good. Good mothers have abortions. I'm one in three. But it's not working. Because guess what? We're human beings. And there's something written on our hearts that tell us that killing other human beings is wrong. It's sad. It's solemn outside of the abortion facility. She's there not because she feels like she's choosing some great right. She's there because she feels like she has to choose between the life of her child and her life, her education, her career. First wave um, feminist Maddie Brinkerhoff wrote, when a man steals to satisfy hunger, we may safely conclude that there is something wrong in our society. So when a woman destroys the life of her more child, it's evidenced by either education or circumstances that she's been greatly wrong. <coughs> Ladies, our country has failed her through our own laziness. We've led her to the doors of Planned Parenthood or to that other abortion facility, which will profit from her despair. And it can go on. The list, the list goes on and on about all the harmful effects of abortion. Finland, they found a statistical association between abortion and suicide. The mean annual suicide rate for all women was 11.3 per 100,000, but the rate following abortion was 34.7, three times higher. The suicide rate associated by birth was half the rate of all women and less than one-sixth the rate of suicide among women who had an abortion. One study found that uh, PTSD report following abortion was 1.5%. Another found that 14% of w American women suffer symptoms of PTSD following their abortions. Analysis of 15 years of published research in the British Journal of Psychiatry found that women who had undergone abortion experienced an 81% risk of mental health problems. 81%. 2003 article in Obstetrical and Gynecological Survey compiled the results of several studies on abortion, found that the risk of placenta previa, which if you don't know what placenta previa, Google it, it can kill you and the child, it increased in later pregnancies by 50%. The abortion doubled the risk of preterm birth. We've seen the studies about birth control and breast cancer. Don't bring that up on a college campus. No one wants to talk about that. Cancer Causes Control concluded that one abortion increased the risk of breast cancer by 44%. This was a Chinese study. It was a meta-analysis of 36 studies in China covering 14 provinces. By the way, China is not a pro-life country, so they have no interest in, like, skewing studies, all of which compared the risk of breast cancer among women who had induced abortions with those who did not. Let me be clear, we don't need abortion vendors like Planned Parenthood preying on our generation. We have enough resources like her to help her. There are more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers that all receive taxpayer dollars that provide services to women, including birth control, SD screening, pregnancy tests, actually provide way more services to women, provide services to children and men who are located in urban and rural areas, underserved communities, that are true nonprofits and don't contribute more than $30 million into the political cycle every two years. FQHCs actually serve patients at a cheaper rate with our taxpayer dollars, $146 versus $185 at Planned Parenthood. 
you can go to findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov and it geolocates for you and tells you where all the federally qualified health centers are in your community. Next time you're talking to someone about why Planned Parenthood is so great, go to Planned Parenthood's website and then go to findahealthcenter.hrsa.gov. Also, fun fact, if a federally qualified health center doesn't offer a service that you need, they are actually legally obligated to make sure you have transportation to the center to get you there. Do you think Planned Parenthood is going to do that? Planned Parenthood is not just a health center that happens to do abortions. They are abortion business. 2006, they committed one out of every five abortions. Today, they commit one out of every three. There was an undercover study that my friend David did not too long ago at the NAF conference, National Abortion Federation Conference, and inside this conference, these abortionists were complaining about Planned Parenthood because they're the Walmart of the abortion business. And they come into town, and they put out the small abortion businesses. And they thought they were friends, but what's Planned Parenthood doing? Planned Parenthood's STD screenings, their prenatal services, everything that they've done has dropped since 2006. The only thing that has increased in services at Planned Parenthood since 2006 has been their abortions. Their patients have dropped by 19%, yet their, their revenue, because of us, has gone up to 30%. They are an abortion vendor. They have quotas for each and every one of their abortion facilities. They have to commit so many abortions a month or they get in trouble. Their employees get rewarded for meeting their quotas, their sales quotas. Further proof is when Ivanka Trump met with Cecile Richards last spring and they tried to do this like cool thing like, hey, we're gonna make the pro-lifers shut up and you can, we'll continue to give you money but you just incorporate Abortion Inc. over here on the side and then we can say we defunded Planned Parenthood's abortion business and you continue to do it and we'll all be friends. Cecile Richards actually tweeted out after that meeting well, Planned Parenthood leaked the meeting. Then Cecile Richard tweeted out after, PP is proud to provide abortion, a necessary service that's as vital to our mission as birth control or cancer screenings. And she told the Trump administration, hell no, we're not changing what we're doing. Abortion stays. A necessary service that's as vital to our mission as birth control and cancer screenings. Really, catching HPV and treating HPV Keep catching ovarian cancer and treating ovarian cancer, which they don't do now, they, just, they can just do screens, that's as important to them as committing a violent act against an innocent human being. And then when, that, when she does decide to have kids, when she does decide, I'm going to do this and I have the time to have a child, it's when that fifth lie of mainstream feminism comes into play. And it's something that it was hard, this was the hardest one for me to overcome. It's like, yeah, you can do it, and it's going to be easy. No one ever takes you aside in high school or college. I mean, they don't teach you how to like balance checking books and things like that. That would be helpful. But no one takes you aside and says, by the way, being a woman is this incredible honor. It's an incredible privilege that you can grow another human being inside of you and that you're smart enough to do all this other stuff, but it's going to be hard and you're going to have to make sacrifices. That something always has to give. And it's a constant struggle, a balance of priorities for mothers. Often, I have a lot of mentees and they're women and they ask me, uh, you know, their number one question is, how do you do it? How are you a mom of four? How do you run the organization? How do you travel? And my, my first piece of advice is stop accept, accepting that myth, that feminist myth, that you can have it all. I am a woman, hear me roar. Like you are going to need help. No one can have it all. And the sooner you accept it, the better off you'll be. No one has enough time in the day to be the best mom, the best wife, the best executive, the best citizen. Something always has to give. One of my mentors told me, you know, you have glass balls and you have rubber balls, and you're constantly juggling, juggling them as a woman. And you have to figure out what your glass balls are and what your rubber balls are. Rubber balls, if you drop them, they will bounce back up. But glass balls, things like your faith, your health, your family, if you drop them, they will shatter. And it's a constant thing. This is something I struggle with all the time. Or are my balls messed up? Do I got something? I know, it's funny. Ha, huh? <laughs> my balls are messed up. But do I, am I treating something like a glass ball that's really a rubber ball? Is this glass ball going to fall and shatter? And it's something that we're not prepared for. No one tells us this. And it's not just true for women. It's also true for men, although we multitask better. Every choice costs us something. And choosing to have that career, choosing to get that great education, and also choosing to be a wife and mother is going to be hard. And you have to really want to do it. So I guess you can say I'm angry about the lies of mainstream feminism that they've been repeating for the last 50 years. 
I'm, I'm angry that we don't talk about these things, that we can't talk about them or have an even civil discussion about them. So for those of us who reject the violence of abortion, who believe in true nonviolent health care, you know, are we just trying to control women's bodies and destroy their lives? No. We fight for choice. We fight for that nonviolent health care. We fight for nonviolent choices. We start with the assumption, unlike Obamacare, that pregnancy is, is we believe that pregnancy is not a preventable disease. Do you realize our federal government says that pregnancy is a preventable disease? That's how, how President Obama got the uh, Obamacare, the birth control mandate required by all employers and health insurances, because we can be, you know, we have to cure a preventable disease. I'm very angry with that. We start with the assumption that our fertility, that the gift of fertility is not a condition that has to be treated with potentially ca cancer-causing medication or depression-inducing medication. We understand that sending her off alone to the abortionist is wrong, that there's no justice in it for her, that the reasons that led her to the abortion facility are still going to be there when she walks out whether she's in poverty or an abusive relationship. We've only just prolonged and potentially compounded her struggle. Instead of seeking to build a real relationship with her to provide real social justice, we've outsourced our duty to Planned Parenthood and the abortionist down the street who's waiting to make a profit. It's the pro-life movement. I believe it's this pro-life generation that advocates for women and families in need. Because we, we can't just believe in shipping her off. We want to help her build a life for herself and her child. Students for Life, we have a program called Pregnant on Campus. And that's what we do every day. That's what Students for Life groups like George's does at the University of Alabama, of providing that opportunity, of saying there is another way, of being that other voice. So do I call myself a feminist anymore, people ask? Honestly, I don't really care about the label. I think the label has been destroyed, and it's going to continue to be destroyed. 20% of American women call her feminists, even though majority of American women agree with the goals of feminism, equality, duh. I mean, there's probably one person who doesn't, but there's always one. I, don't, I know, though, I don't want my voice. I don't want my story. I don't want my testimony. I don't want those be co-opted or being used by the feminist movement. I want the lies that the mainstream feminist movement is selling brought to light. I want women to understand that choice isn't either or. I want women to feel empowered to understand that their happiness, their goals and aspirations can be achieved, that those things that really matter in life can, can be found. I want women in this generation to know that this pro-life group of kids, this pro-life gen, we stand for nonviolence. We stand for equality, those two fundamental principles of feminism. And those, and those beliefs are found in the pro-life movement, the anti-abortion movement. So that's the label I really care about. I think we have time for like two questions, maybe. You were the fast. You were fast. What's oh? Here's a micro. involved in the Students for Life on my college campus and we had a huge pro-life week. And it was really, really amazing, everything that we did. But a question that I have is how all these research for pregnant on campus, but what no one is talking about is how, or I'm sure some people are talking about it, but like how are young girls getting into this position? I mean, the hookup, probably the hookup culture, but what do you have to What's an answer for that to stop them from getting to sure. this point? Where I mean, really, that years. starts in middle and high school, and that's a conversation we have a lot in high school and middle school of where is happiness found? What's your dignity as a human being? And that's a conversation that, quite frankly, isn't being, hap isn't being heard or isn't happening. Um, we're not talking about, you know, we have, you know, we have comprehensive sex ed, so sexual risk of, you know, reduction. We don't really have SRA, sexual risk avoidance. Um, which is, you know, the gold standard of public health. We don't talk about these things of, hey, you don't have to do this. The good news is the CDC has found that, like, more than 70% of 15 to 17-year-olds are actually not having sex. That it's actually starting, people are starting to go, oh, wow, maybe I don't have to have sex. It was like this big thing in the 90s. Everyone had sex, even in the early 2000s. But, it's, you know, the trend's starting to reverse itself a little bit. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's a question of, and it's a discussion of dignity and a discussion of value. And what is your value as a woman? 
And why are you devaluing yourself by putting, you know, getting into these relationships with men who are simply just trying to use you and they're using your body? Um, but that's a, that's a hard discussion to have. And it's something that, you know, it talks about the intrinsic worth of human beings, which, by the way, is a pro-life message, that we all have intrinsic worth and we all deserve to be treated with respect. Um, so, but yeah, it's, I think it's off, often a conversation between moms and daughters and dads and daughters of, you have value. Why would you, why would you sleep with somebody or why would you put yourself in a situation with a man who you know is simply just using you? Not to demonize men. No, all men do that. Um, I just had a quick question because I, a lot of times, when talking to pro-choice people on my campus, they'll bring up the argument that you might have heard before that restricting access to abortion just restricts access to safe abortion and that it's still going to happen anyway. Mm. So how do we both push a pro-life agenda and also kind of combat that culture that says, oh, they'll do it anyway. Sure, well there's a couple of things with the safety and the legality. Um, abortion isn't safe today. Planned Parenthood has a brand new shiny building down the street and women will die there. Abortion isn't safe today. Um, and so when we talk about a safety of abortion, there's stuff that you can know in like history. So Bernard Nathanson made up the lie that 10,000 women a year were dying from illegal abortion. 1960, Planned Parenthood's own medical director, Mary Calderon, said it was about 500 women a year dying from illegal abortion. The numbers of women dying from illegal abortion had dramatically dropped because of the invention of penicillin, because the, the main uh, factor, contributing factor to women dying from illegal abortion was infection. 1972, the Centers for Disease Control reported the number of deaths. It was about 70 women who had died from illegal abortions and about 80 women who died from legal abortions. So women died uh, before abortion was legal and they die after abortion is illegal. Um, I think the question is, when you're talking about abortion and you know someone t says that to you, I think they want pro-lifers to be like, yeah, well, we care about women, so therefore abortion, we want abortion to be safer, less women die. Um, but we don't make other things that are morally wrong legal to make them safer. We don't make bank robbery illegal because people get killed in bank robberies, and usually the bank robbers are the ones shot dead by the police. We don't make that legal um, because it's dangerous um, and someone could possibly die. And when you're talking about a moral issue as, as abortion, of like, there's no way, and that's something when we look at the polls on abortion, and sometimes people argue like, well, abortion doesn't need to be made illegal. We don't have to overturn our way. We just change the culture. And I think it's, a, I think it's you do both. But I think there's always going to be people in America who are sympathetic to abortion as long as it's legal because we equate our, mor sadly, we create our morality with our legality, which, by the way, is a really crummy way of doing things because look what's happened in our nation's history where we equated uh, legality with morality. But we don't make something that's a, a human rights violation uh, legal because it can potentially be dangerous. It, even though we do care for women and we love women and we want them to live, that's why we don't want them to have abortions in the first place. Does that make sense? It's hard. Like in the public movement, like there's not like 30 second like bam, bam. I mean, you could do that, but then it often when you're, when you're conversing with someone on campus, they, they, they want to know how much you care. I mean, so that John Maxwell adage of like, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So often like when you're having discussions like this, people are thinking through these issues and they want to know, like the first thing they want to know is that you're not a jerk, is that you care. Um, so often from the feminist crowd, you'll hear that they support Planned Parenthood because they say like, oh, well, they help with cancer screenings and so many other services, which you know are they're destroying their numbers, but they'll also from a legal standpoint bring up the high and the wonderful. It doesn't, funding doesn't go, taxpayer funding doesn't go directly towards abortion, but from an economic standpoint, you'll know that when they're able to fund other areas, they're able to perform more. Fungibility. So how, yes. How can you best address that when you're confronted with somebody that's making that argument? Sure. Well, one thing is you can look like their cancer screenings have decreased by 30%. Like you can pull up their own annual reports. As their federal funding has increased, all of their other good services have decreased. The only thing that's gone up are their abortion services. That shows you right away what is it that Planned Parenthood's really about. Yes, bring up fungibility. Yeah, okay, fine. I can't pay for the abortionist 25 minutes doing that suction aspiration abortion, but I'm paying for the lights, I'm paying for the room, I'm paying for the parking lot. We actually allow, and that's actually, there was a Wall Street Journal article not too long ago with his mom and pop abortionist. 
she was mad because she was being driven out of business by Planned Parenthood. And she was like, yeah, Planned Parenthood's like the Walmart of the abortion industry. They get to subsidize their, basically how Walmart can subsidize their gas. If you can the Walmart Sam's Club, they offer gas at lower rates because the business is subsidizing the gas. They can offer their abortions at lower rates because everything else is being subsidized by taxpayers. Um, so th definitely you bring up fungibility when you're talking to people. Also, say, so look. There's more than 8,000 federally qualified health centers across the country. There's less than 600 Planned Parenthoods. Planned Parenthood only serves 2 million people every year. Federally qualified health centers serve 21 million men and women every year. They serve them on an average $40 cheaper per person. They provide way more services than Planned Parenthood provides. Why would we fund them? Oh, and by the way, federally qualified health centers are true nonprofits. Planned Parenthood's putting more than $30 million into the election. We actually have a display at Students for Life called uh, we don't need Planned Parenthood, and we list out all the services federally qualified health centers provide, the little services Planned Parenthood provides, all the tax dollars that we give Planned Parenthood, which is more than federally qualified health centers. And we make this very logical case of like, look, even if you disagree with me on abortion, don't you think for our taxpayers' dollars, this is a better bargain for us. And we have students actually vote, we have Wood and Nichols, and they get to vote where they're taxpayers. The only people that ever put their nickels in the Planned Parenthood jar are the liberal administrators. Uh, we have students who like put it in Planned Parenthood and then they talk to us and they go into the jar and they pick it out and put it into the public because it just makes sense. It just makes sense. Does that make, does that help? Okay. You guys have microphones, sorry. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe comment on the changing perceptions between different generations from baby boomers, Generation X, Millennials, and now Gen Z or I Gen, whichever you want to call it, but like how much more likely are younger people to understand the right to life? And do you think that that's because of science? Um, and maybe if you want to comment on like the, the trend though in younger people to be less willing to admit the differences between men and women, as you say, saying that men and women are different is probably one of the most controversial things you can say now. So Yeah, because there's like 56 genders or something like that. Exactly, so like how do those two things, even if we are more pro-life than we ever were, like it, is it? Sure. Yeah, no, definitely this generation, we call it the pro-life generation. Have you ever heard that ta tagline or seen those signs? That's us. Um, and we, it was a kind of like a Saul Linsky principle. We totally did it before the polls were in our favor. Just, you know, declare it and they will come. Um, but yeah, this generation is more pro-life. They, they view abortion as a moral wrong because of science. They've seen their brothers and sisters via ultrasound. Many of them know someone who's had a personal experience with abortion. Like they know, and they and we have a sense of justice and fairness. And we're like, wow, that's a baby sucking its thumb, ripping it apart, not justice. Um, so we have that advantage over Generation X and you know the baby boomers. You know, Generation X is probably the most pro-abortion generation in our country. Uh, they're the they're the nasty ones. They're the ones that spit at us at the Supreme Court events. Like it's the adults being mean to the students, not the other way around. Um, I think we have a lot more hope too with Generation Z. Um, I think the challenge we have generationally is that with the election of Donald Trump, um, the left has been so vocal and so out there that th you know, you, we just start seeing polls skewing back. So we're actually losing ground with, with a pro-life president. We gained a whole bunch of ground with, during the eight disastrous years of Obama, and now we've been losing ground. I think that's, it's, I kind of expected that because the other side is so vocal. They're so out there, and it's, they're taking away your freedom. They're taking away your choice. Hurry up. Stand up. We have to fight back. And we have to speak just as loud to that of, of how this is an in injustice. And I think that's how when we talk on college campuses, we talk on high schools, or even middle schools or graduate schools, we frame this issue as a human rights issue, as a justice issue, because this generation is justice driven. Now, this generation is also very liberal. Um, some of it's branding. So like we did one poll where we had 53% of millennials agree that abortion should be illegal in all or almost every circumstance, which by the way is like a huge study. Um, but then only 36% said they were pro-life. The RNC has done studies before where they've asked economic questions to millennials, right? And then they, but the ones they found out they were Republican, they hated them. So there's a, I think that one, there's a branding issue that we were always trying, that's why like if you see us, it's always like pro gen, beautiful, smiling, young girl faces. Like we're very intentional about who's in front of the, of the photographers and like the poor men in my organization, I'm like, get back, get back. Um, oh, you're a cute metrosexual guy. You can say up front, like, I'm like, I'm really bad. Um, so I think part of it is a branding issue of there's just an overall perception of what pro-life is or what conservative or Republican is. 
um, that, that can become an issue. But there is, you know, you look at millennials' views on gay marriage and other things, they do lean liberal. They're, we're the least church generation. Um, we're the most diverse generation. We've grown up. Most of the generation grew up in this, the Great Recession, they're calling it. Um, I actually make the case often to like conservative folks who are like, yeah, I'm pro-life, but like I'd rather just give my money candidates. I'm like, dude, you, we are your only hope. <laughs> like we are going to make more conservatives. We actually, secret, like we bring in more conservatives. Like because people come to us and they might be liberal or they won't be whatever. And we're like, okay, whatever. It's a human rights issue, join us. But then they're suddenly gonna be surrounded by other conservative thinkers and voters. It's belong, believe, behave. And that's how you evangelize, that's how you have culture change. So, hope that helped. This will be the last one. Yeah. I'll stay, I'll go outside if you want to stop me. I'm going to Dave Matthews concert later, so. I guess I'm But can you tell I'm old because I said Hello. that? You guys are like, ha, ha, ha. So, uh, you talked about equating morality with legality, so that reminded me a lot about, like, you've used the words property and goods. So, I, I've been faced with this argument I, for being pro-choice, so I'm curious how you would respond to it, because I find it very difficult to respond to as well. So uh, maximizing happiness slash utility versus um, minimizing suffering. So people who would argue for saying that like, they're pro-choice because in the long run, like you are, I, I guess, kind of as like, a social control kind of thing and using abortion as almost like a means before, or yeah, using abortion as a means so you're not really considering uh, like what what the end would be for the individual, but more as for like society. Like how how would you go about sure. arguing arguing that point? I think the the philosophical truth that most women have learned is that freedom is not found in the autonomy to do what serves oneself. Like we say that that's freedom. Um, that's the mantra of the second wave feminist. But you know, the Greeks said the freedom was the power to choose the good. And I think that um, happiness and freedom, and we, you don't have to look much further than all the women who've suffered from abortion. When you're talking about someone who's saying, oh, well, you're just weighing the societal impacts you know, versus the, the individual. Well, no, we can actually look to see that abortion hurts women. Abortion demeans women. Abortion, um, it's, it doesn't empower women. It, it actually strips their power from them. Um, and so there's plenty of examples out there of Silent No More and all these women who are post-abortive who, and men now who speak openly out against their abortion uh, and speak out against it. I mean, it's been so effective that the abortion industry is now doing this like stigmatized thing. So no one's allowed to talk about abortion because if you talk about abortion, it's negative. You can stigmatize somebody who's had an abortion. You can hurt them. They're already hurting. It's already happening. And us just shutting up doesn't solve the problem. But I think you, you look at like happiness and um, Suzanne, I was looking up Suzanne Vinker. Uh, so she's Phyllis Shafley, late Phyllis Shafley's daughter-in-law. She often writes for um, uh, Fox News. And she, she writes like anti-feminist stuff all the time. But she, um, she wrote this column and I put it in my speech and I don't usually use it. But she said that the feminist worldview is antithetical to love because its focus is solely on the women, their needs, their wants, their desires, their rights. Love can't possibly sustain with an attitude like that. And I think that's, you know, happiness doesn't come from you satisfying all your economic desires or all your career desires. Look at Kate Spade, I only have Kate Spade purses. Look at Anthony Bourdain, these, these people that are like, oh my gosh, you must have an amazing, incredible life. And then they take their own life. That's not where you drive happiness from. Happiness comes from relationships, of being loved and loving others, of serving others and other, having other people serving you. Um, happiness involves that positive relationship between other people. Loneliness, I mean, Mother Teresa said loneliness was the ultimate form of poverty. It, happiness isn't just serving yourself, it's serving others and serving the good and having the freedom, the power to choose the good. Does that make sense? It's a little philosophically heavy for a Saturday morning, but it's a hard, it's a hard concept to complain. There's, um, uh, there's another person, there's a Jesuit priest. Uh, um, he's written a, a, an awful lot about uh, Father Spitzer. It's S-P-I-T-Z-R. He was the president of Gonzaga University, and he's written a whole book on uh, happiness 
and the levels of happiness. And one of the curriculums we, we propose in high schools are these four foundations of happiness. And you don't have to talk about political issues, you don't talk about abortion, you don't talk about sex, but you just talk about where does happiness come from? And you can see like abortion and all these things are low level happiness because they serve yourself. That's all they serve. Hope that helps. Thank you all.